Okay, good morning, everyone. So today I'm going to do a real quick computer forensics demonstration. We're also gonna look at the application of a lot of the concepts that we've covered specifically within the Windows operating system. So to describe our environment, the framework I'm about to present, I am gonna show Windows 7, but it is executing within a virtual machine. So I'm starting with this slide previously presented in the chapter on systems administration systems and now, excuse me, pardon me, uh, systems software. Okay, so here's our virtualization stack. We're very familiar with the machine architecture, right? And it has an inherent and specific instruction set. But of course, this instruction set is very difficult to work with. So we need this intermediary software the operating system, which will perform the abstraction. It'll interface with the instruction set them directly with the machine architecture. And again, there may be device drivers here and provides this uniform, much easier to work with interface to the application layer. And of course, this is user space as well. Now you're seeing something here that's new. We have the operating system, the OS, but in this case, we're referring to the base operating system as the host operating system because it is interacting directly with the machine architecture. And again, this is coming in Linux Lab 9 where everyone will implement their own virtual machines. When we install virtual machine software, and there are several different versions, there's VMware, there's Parallels for Mac, there's VirtualBox, and Windows actually even has some native virtualization, the Hyper, Hyper-V, et cetera. And I'll address this later when we get to Linux Lab 9. So we install virtual machine software. Note that it is at the same level as Microsoft Word. Now, Microsoft Word, of course, what do we use it for? To write, you know, papers, things of this nature. So it'll take as input files, right? And of course, these files are stored on the storage system. When we install virtual machine software, well, okay, we have a virtual machine software set up. But to actually use it, we need to install guest operating systems. For Linux Lab 9, we'll use the Linux operating system. What I'm about to show today is the Windows operating system in a virtualized environment or a Windows virtual machine. So these operating system virtual machines are essentially resources, inputs to the virtual machine in the same fashion that a Microsoft Word file document or some paper you're writing is to the Microsoft Word application. Once we have a guest operating system installed in a virtual machine, well, then we can install additional applications. And in my Windows 7 guest virtual machine, I actually do have Microsoft Word, another instance installed there. Okay, so here's the framework. And I'm now going to jump to my virtual machine. So you're seeing a Windows 7 virtual machine here. Okay, let's cover some concepts <clears throat> that we have already covered and see the application of them. So I'm choosing the start menu. And the first thing I want to show, we, we know now, this was presented in the textbook, that Windows actually has a command line interface, a CLI. And it is cmd.exe. So I'll type that just to search. It's easier searching that than trying to go through and, and find it within my list of programs. <clears throat> and I apologize for the font size, but take a look, okay? We know that in Windows, we use drive letters. In Linux, of course, it's mounts. Um, we note that directories here are separated in Windows by the backslash, we know in Linux that there we use the forward slash, okay? We know from my prompt, I can see where I am in the directory structure. So in my users, you know, Professor James Luby, I'm gonna type something here. I know it's not accepted, but I'm gonna type ls, which of course is a, a, a directory listing in Linux. And I'm essentially getting the equivalent of command not found, right? So Windows does not recognize ls. Recall what happens when I type something at the command line. It's going to execute the associated program, okay? In Windows, of course, in Linux, there is an ls. In Windows, there's not. 
So Windows uses dir for a directory listing. And I can see this, okay? If you've ever looked at your file system on Windows, right? This should look familiar, desktop, documents, downloads, etc. Great. I'm not gonna go into further detail, but this command line interface does exist, still exists within Windows. Okay, the other thing I said I would present is the MS config, the configuration of a system, specifically for say the startup menu. We know what happens with the boot sequence, right? The power on self-test loads the BIOS, loads the operating system, specifically the kernel, and then possibly other startup programs are started. And we know that those other programs, of course, all execution takes place in memory. When they sit on a disk, static program, and then I execute it, it comes into memory and becomes a process, and it gets resources allocated to it by the operating system. Recall the operating system is that resource manager. So I'm gonna to get to startup menu here in just a minute, but take a look at your general. There's several things I can do here in my system configuration. I can have a normal startup, right? Selective startup, okay, diagnostic startup. So if something is going wrong with your system, this is one of the first places to start. Specifically, I'll move on to the boot and I can see that I can enable a safe boot. With a safe boot, only the operating system kernel and necessary device drivers will be loaded. So if there's some application, could be antivirus, you know, it's improperly configured, who knows, that is interfering with your computing, this is a way to do it. And I can, of course, go into the advanced options. And I won't talk about this at this juncture. I will come back to it. <clears throat> Look at this, no GUI boot, no graphical user interface, which means you're gonna boot Windows into that command line interface. Recall with the graphical user interface, this can cause problems. Minimally, it takes up a lot of memory, right? So if I want a, just a bare bone system, if I'm trying to debug my system, or maybe I just wanna provide a command line interface to whatever end user. Recall, inherently, a command line interface will increase security. Prior to your work with Linux, would you ever have walked up to a terminal and typed ls thinking, oh, that's the directory listing? Just, just coming up with that on your own? No, okay? You need specific knowledge to actually interact with an operating system through the command line interface. I could enable the boot log. I may wanna see what is going on. See, because it will of course identify and document any errors it encounters. Services, what services are running? and we see a lot. Recall, all of these are active processes. Processes, of course, necessarily are in memory. So with all these services running, there's less memory available for your other processing, whatever it is you're doing. And I could go through these, and, and I have gotten rid of some of them. Um, ActiveX, I don't need that, I could easily stop that service, um, BitLocker. I'm not using encryption on this, this operating system here. So I could do that. I'm gonna leave it for now just because I don't want to do a reboot at this juncture. And it will force me to do a reboot if I were to um, apply that. Startup. So here's where you would go. Again, MS config. I typed MS config in the search box on my start menu. And you can see I've actually unchecked many. I don't need iTunes continually checking with Apple through the course of my processing. I don't need Adobe updating itself or checking things, right? Just, just taking away memory from other processes that I really, really want to run, okay? Um, by the way, in both services and startup, should you uncheck one of these, please do your research beforehand. You could just say, if Google, if necessary, Adobe Reader, you know, whatever it is, okay? Whatever the, this, this name is here, the startup system. So it's a good way to do it. Tools, there are many tools here, okay? And I could launch all these tools. 
but I'm not going to go into that in more detail. I am now going to my control panel. And you can see that I've actually pulled this out because I will use this a lot because I need to, well, have control of my system. I've never liked when you first open that, I've never liked the way that that is first presented. I've always liked this screen better. It has all the same functionality. It just reformats it differently. But you'll see many things here, okay? We know in software, in the system, our system should be updating, applying whatever security patches come down the line. We could be sleeping at 3 a.m. in the morning. I don't want to wait until I wake up to apply the security patch. I want Windows to do it automatically. Backup and restore. We covered this in both storage and in operating systems, right? Again, many of us will just drag over the files we want to back up to a USB drive. But here is a way we can actually schedule it. And we can determine. Recall there are three types. There's a full backup, an incremental backup, and a differential. And they impose different things specifically when it comes time to restore them. So we've covered all these. BitLocker, drive encryption. I'm going to cover this in a minute from a different perspective. Okay. Administrative tools, freeing up disk space, defragmenting hard drive. Again, I'm going to cover this from a different perspective. There's another way to get to it. So let's see if I can move this out of the way, get rid of this window. I'm now going to open up my Windows Explorer. And this, everybody's familiar with this, of course. Give me a second here. And so I, I just clicked on, you know, local drive C. And I see, of course, the directory structure. Windows, of course, calls them folders. This should be, begin to look very familiar based on our work with Linux. Many people do not know this exists here, this functionality. I've now highlighted local disk C and I'm gonna right click on it. And if you don't have a two button mouse, you can just hold down the control key and hit click as well. I need to move the window out of the way and I'm gonna choose properties. So here are the properties from local disk C. I see my use space, my free space, et cetera, pretty full. Um, I could probably clean this up a little. But take a look, compress this drive to save disk space. We spoke about file and disk compression. Recall there are two types of compression, lossy versus lossless. This being data, it's required that the compression be lossless. Now, would I really want to compress my entire drive? Probably not, because that will incur some processing overhead, actually considerable processing overhead. Because if I compress my if I compress my drive, it has to be decompressed whenever it comes out, or whenever I write something to, to the drive, of course it has to be compressed. So there's a pr additional processing component. And we saw the discrepancy between the speed of the CPU and the storage. It was already just just almost intolerable. So do I want to slow that down any further? I do have. Another mechanism though, recall what I can do is I can partition my hard drive. I can create two logical hard drives from a single physical hard drive. Recall, creating multiple logical resources from a single physical resource is called multiplexing. And on this, I'll just pause. As I'm presenting this, please think in your minds, did I know this as, as he's presenting this? If not, it's a clear indication you're not doing enough. You're not studying hard enough. You're leaving gaps in your understanding that will come back and they will haunt us and bite us, okay? So please understand, we need to learn this from the ground up. We need an exacting attention to detail, precise terminology, et cetera. Okay, um, allow files on this drive to have Contents indexed, this was presented as well. Modern file systems do support indexing. And you'll see, I do not have this checked. Why? Because I spoke about this. If I create an index of the contents of a file, yes, it's incredibly inconvenient for me to put in a search word and for the operating system to tell me, oh yes, it's in these five files, this six files. 
that's great, it's highly convenient. But again, where does all processing take place? In memory. So necessarily, this index needs to be in memory. If it's in memory, there's less memory for other processing tasks. So again, I don't do this just because I want all of the memory in this particular system for processing. Okay, this cleanup, by the way, will go through and of course clean your recycle bin. We'll go through and find temporary files though. Windows will actually write a lot of log files that aren't necessary. Yes, if your system goes awry and you need to send that those type of uh, those statistics to Microsoft, yes, but you can always do that again later. Tools, <clears throat> checking the drive for errors. Most people don't know over time, hard drive sectors will become corrupt. And again, I just used another term. Everyone should know what a sector is, okay? The smallest addressable unit on a storage device. Often we call, speak about them as block accessible. We use kind of two be interchangeable, although we do refer to blocks also as clusters. It's probably more appropriate. And I just use the word cluster. So when I think of sector, smallest addressable unit comprised of 512 bytes. We need to know this information. So checking the drive for errors will go through your entire drive and mark and flag any sectors that have gone bad so they're not reused. Defragmenting your hard drive. Again, users rarely do this. And this will slow down all your processing. We saw the discrepancy in the storage hierarchy between the CPU and our storage device. Recall our storage device are susceptible to mechanical latencies. We have that mechanical read-write arm moving in and out over the spinning disk. And then the read-write heads, of course, have to wait for the correct sector or cluster to rotate underneath them. These are mechanical latencies in the range of milliseconds in contrast to our CPU that are billions of cycles per second. So when I write something to disk or say Microsoft Word, right? I'm working Microsoft Word, I, I'm writing a paper, I hit save. Recall, Microsoft Word sends a system call to the operating system, the resource manager, and asks the operating system to save the file. The operating system consults its table of free sectors or clusters to determine where it can save this file. And more often than not, unless it's a very small file, they're not going to be contiguous clusters, which means adjacent, one after another, which means it's going to have to split up the file and save it in several places, which of course, when I go to get, get that file back, that read-write arm has to move mechanical latencies. So it makes sense over time to defragment a hard drive. And what, what the operating system will do is collect all the components of a particular file and kind of rewrite the hard drive so that files are all contiguous, adjacent, right? So in the same tracks, one after another. Backup, again, we've covered backup. And it is nice to have your system periodically backup itself, right? Rather than us remembering, oh, I haven't backed up in a while. I need to put a thumb drive in and back up the files. I can schedule this Sunday morning at 3 a.m. Write it to a DVD, write it to a attached USB drive, write it to a attached storage device. And again, I, I'm not gonna back up everything. I'm not going to back up my operating system, all the applications. It's really just the data files, the really important things. Hardware, some very interesting things here. Um, and a lot of, a lot's in the properties, I won't open this, but I will pause at this point. We are all from this point forward, I said this on day one, computer science professionals. And if you're really interested in this field, it is necessary that everyone go through this, okay? Open up your control panel and go through all the settings. We now have the conceptual background to understand everything that is going on here, okay? It may require some more research and we may not understand the, the specific programming of it, but we do understand this. Um, security, well, our last lab, permissions on particular directories or files, okay? So we can see the direct 
application within Windows of what we're learning in Linux. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave this now. I just wanted to introduce that. Move this so I can close this window. Now I'm gonna to get to the real interesting stuff, the forensics demonstration. <clears throat> so before I get there, let's see, I have to go to show folders. Courses. So we're going through my, my file system here. And okay, so I'm in the forensics subdirectory. And I see I have two documents here. Okay. One's a text file, the other is a Microsoft Word. I'm going to click on the text file first. And there's not much here, right? Text space file, nine characters. Okay, and that's it. There's no, nowhere to scroll. There's nothing else in there. Take a look at this listing here. It says it's taking up one kilobyte on my disk. I don't believe that. So I'm going to right click again. And again, if I don't have a two button mouse, I can just hold down the control key and I can choose properties. It tells me correctly it's nine bytes long. Size on disk, though, is 4096. Can anyone tell me why this is occurring? And I understand people are shy. They don't want to speak. I get it. Okay. So just in your head, if you didn't know this, okay, if you couldn't conclude this or derive this, there's a gap there, right? How do we save things on disk? Minimal, minimum, minimal addressable unit is the sector, but we don't have enough addresses. So we group sectors into clusters in powers of two. We know the sector is 512 bytes. This file is being saved in 4096. So what do we have? Eight sectors per cluster. I've actually determined my cluster size. Now, why is this further important? This text file, when I wrote it, I saved it to disk. And I was actually the editor that saved it to disk. So of course, the important parts of the file were only nine bytes long. But the operating system did not write nine bytes to my file system. The minimal addressable transfer size is going to be a block transfer, 4096. So what did the operating system do? Well, it took those nine bytes that was you know text file, great. But what followed that in memory? Because it grabbed the remaining, what, 4087 bytes from the next portions in memory and wrote it to disk. I'm now getting into RAM and file slack. What the operating system did, you know, it did what it does, but it left breadcrumbs, hints on my hard drive of what the user was doing. This is a portion of, of digital forensics because who knows what was following these nine bytes in memory? It could have been a web page open that showed where the user was looking. Maybe it was a good site, maybe it was a bad site, who knows? Could have been an email. Maybe it was sensitive. That email maybe was contained sensitive information and without the user's awareness, a portion of it was written to disk for a computer forensic specialist later to investigate and find. Users do not know this. Bad guys do not know this is occurring. So, okay, I'm now gonna open an application here, okay? So this is Synalyze It Pro. This is a binary hexadecimal editor. What a binary hexadecimal editor will allow me to do is to look at my hard drive from whatever perspective I could look at the complete raw data, but I could also look at specific files and their representation. Now, having said this, you can go out and get a binary hexadecimal editor. I actually don't recommend it at this juncture, but should you do that, do not save anything. Be very careful because you'll be working with your raw hard drive. You can compromise and corrupt your hard drive in a blink, snap of a finger. If you change something within your operating system, you can toast your system. If you change something within the master boot record, 
your hard drive will become inaccessible. You'll lose everything. Now, there are ways to get it back. Yes, I could get it back. Um, but at this juncture, I would recommend against getting a binary decimal, a hexadecimal editor. So just get rid of that. Here we go. So I'm going to open, right? I'm in my forensics directory, just as I just was in Windows. And I'm going to open up that text file. I'm not going to download the grammar. The grammar, by the way, will be part of the file format. I'm going to show you also where to file find file formats. Recall, a file format is corresponds to a specific application, the way the application uses that representation, that logical file representation. So here we have my text file.txt. In the left, we see how it is represented on disk. This is what's on disk. 0x, we know what that 0x preface means. It's in hexadecimal, okay? Now this is an address, by the way. And then we see the counting of the address on through 09, 0a, 0b, 0c, et cetera. So here's the representation. These are as the ASCII representation and the binary hexadecimal editor will show me the actual ASCII characters. So capital T is ASCII 54, lowercase e is ASCII 65. And I can see that there's another 65 here, which is that trailing E here. Now take a look what I'm going to do because a binary hexadecimal editor will allow me to modify the contents of the file. So I'll put a one there. And I can see now the 65 changed to 31, the ASCII representation of one. Now, why is this important? I'm going to close this text file properties. I'm going to open text file again, and I can see I changed it on disk without using my text editor. I didn't use Microsoft Word. I didn't use anything. I went directly to the hard drive, and it was actually the binary hex hexadecimal editor that did this, and it did send a system call and all this. So there is some, some logging, but I was able to change something on disk. Now, in this case, it was just a text file. But I very easily also, because I, I know I could research the instruction set, I could have put instructions. I could modify an executable. I could modify your operating system so that whenever, or a browser, so that whenever you enter a password, it sends it to me. Okay. Hopefully that has opened everyone's eyes to the import of understanding this at the ground level. I'll close this, go back to my pro, change that back to an E, and I'm actually gonna close this. Now, I'm gonna take a look at this MS Word forensics test file. It says it's being stored in 12 kilobytes. Well, that's a little more reasonable than the text file being stored in one kilobyte, but I'll go to properties, and I see it's actually being stored in 12,288. We already identified the minimal cluster size is 4,096. So I can see that this is being saved on disk in three clusters. Now, if I look at the title of the file, <clears throat> there's something I hear, put here just for me so I can find it, 1BF9. And I'm smiling, I'll show you why in just a minute. So we'll open up. What did I do? I double clicked on that file. Oh boy, I just corrupted it. Trust. Yes. Okay, here we go. It's because I changed it last class. So, and it detected that. Okay, so here's the file. Forensics test file. Okay, there's nothing there, right? Nothing up my sleeve. I could highlight the whole thing, change the font color. I have nothing hidden in clear text. So just please take my word for that. Forensics test file, not sure how many characters there are, but not much, but it's taking up 12 kilobytes on my disk because there is a lot of formatting that Microsoft Word uses. A lot of metadata. Metadata is data about data. If you ever go on in Microsoft Word, you can change the properties of the author, things of this nature, and, and that's what a lot of it is. But a lot of it is also formatting. So here's that Microsoft Word forensics test file. And I see the file format, okay? A lot of stuff. 
And I'm searching for specifically 1B F9 because I put that into the title. So I would be able to find it again later. And you're seeing all the hexadecimal addresses here on the left. 1B, getting there, right here, 1B F9. And look what I did here. Because I can modify this, recall? I can just type things here, GYPE, okay? And what it did, of course, is it changed the file. Here's the ASCII code, you know, that it just changed. But I put a secret message in here. And I did that, I was able to do that because I understand the file format. And I'm gonna show you where those file formats can be found. Every file has a file format, whether it's a picture, a JPEG, or .png, or Microsoft Word, or Adobe Acrobat, right? Adobe Acrobat re requires the files it uses, is the PDFs, to be in a specific format, so it can, of course, work on them, render them, and et cetera. But why did I do this? I'm gonna give you a fictional, entirely fictional scenario. Please know that, I'm saying that with a smile on my face, okay? Here's my fictional scenario. I'm a terrorist and I want to communicate direct my fictional terrorist buddies around the world. How can I do this without anyone catching wind of it, without anyone intercepting the message or at least being able to understand what I was sending? I can modify almost any type of files. I can look at the file format. I can find the fields that may not be critically important to the running of them, and I can change their contents. I can write things in them because all it is, it's just digital. It's just numbers. Now, of course, my binary hexadecimal editor will show me the representation. It'll interpret these bytes, right, as ASCII. <clears throat> now, I would not use clear text, by the way. I'd use another encryption me method. But <clears throat> for the sake of my scenario, I want to communicate with my terrorist buddies. I'm going to take a picture of something I want to sell and put it up on eBay every Monday night at 8 p.m. And my terrorist buddies around the world know that. So they are watching me as a seller on eBay. And whatever I sell Monday at 8 p.m., they're going to download that image, right? Save image as. Easy right click. Just save it to their computer. They open up that file with a binary hexadecimal editor. They go to a specific location, hexadecimal location that I've taught them where to look for this stuff, and they'll extract that message. Now, again, I'm not putting it in clear text as this is secret message. You know, minimally, I could change an A to a B, a B to a C, a C to a D, et cetera, in ASCII, of course. So at least it's not like appearing like this. But think about, you know, encryption methods. How complex must my program be to actually go through every file and look for encrypted messages where I don't know the encryption mechanisms. And again, I'm posting this on eBay, the sheer volume of transactions of things that are posted on eBay, the pictures, it almost makes it impossible to go through all these pictures. I have clearly a mechanism here that without anyone's awareness, I could communicate with my terrorist buddies around the world. And I can pose the question, would you have caught this, right? And there's no way we could have even conceived of catching it if we don't understand this technology, what's going on from the ground up. Now, I did say I would show everyone where, say, file formats are located. By the way, this is all located, the, what I've just done, in the submenu of Lecture Module 5, because it really is system, um, system software. <clears throat> And I go into file formats, file systems, RAM, and file slack as I presented. Down at the bottom, um, there are, and you can find these, the file formats for whatever format is out there. JPEG, PNG, um, you know, DOCX for, for Microsoft Word, PDF for Adobe. And this is necessary that these, these companies put these out because I may be writing an application to where I want it to be able to be saved in PDF. I'm going to save a file in PDF format, I better know the file format. So these file formats are publicly available, and you can go and look at them and determine if you know what you're doing, what are the fields or the areas that are not necessary 
And with these, I can actually modify them. Now I did mention that I did this or could do this with a picture on eBay. That actually has a specific name for it. It's called steganography, it is actually encrypting and hiding messages in pictures. That's all I have for today. Um, hopefully this was eye-opening and have a, have a great day, have a great week, and I'll see everyone next week. Thank you.